Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. We're going to find out about when New York looked like ancient Rome. The original channel is called Told in Stone. I'm going to hit like. Um, the links to the original video will be in the description section down below, as it usually always is. Yeah, I came across this one, and I thought it seemed interesting because I know New York used to be called New Amsterdam. It was founded by the Dutch. And then eventually it became under English rule. They renamed it to New York and blah, blah, blah. Fast forward. Now you have today, right? I didn't know anything about Rome having in, in, you know, anything to do with it. So right here we got when New York looked like ancient Rome. So, I mean, I guess Rome necessarily didn't, ha didn't necessarily have anything to do with it per se. It could just been in, inspired or influenced by Roman architecture. It just because it says looked like ancient Rome, right? And obviously, ancient Rome was was gone by the time New York was uh, was made or New Amsterdam at the time, right? So, anyways, we're gonna find out about this. We're gonna check it out. Hit like, hit subscribe, yeah, all that good fun stuff. I'd like to thank Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video. <laughs> for he shouts out his coffee sponsor as I'm taking a drink of my coffee. That's great. For residents and visitors alike, New York City means modern. The latest restaurant. The hot new show. The cutting edge of architecture. Okay. But in concept and design, many aspects of the city that never sleeps are 2,000 years old directly inspired by Roman architecture and urban planning. If you've ever looked down on New York from the observation decks of the Empire State Building or Rockefeller Center, you've seen the neat street grid that covers most of Manhattan. That grid dates the beginning of the 19th century, when a commission appointed by the New York City Council proposed laying 12 parallel avenues the length of Manhattan and crossing them at 200-foot intervals with perpendicular streets. Besides making Manhattan perennially prone to traffic jams, this scheme placed New York in the tradition of classical city planning. All right, so back here, New Amsterdam, when it was New Amsterdam, was, I believe, this is the original part. You can see where it's not part of the grid pattern. It's just kind of like haphazardly there. So I, I think it was somewhere over here because there's actually uh, remnants of an old village that was basically the predecessor to New York. There was like a, it started as a village, like, it, you know, anything does. And uh, yeah, so somewhere in this area, there's remnants of that old village, old neighborhood. And you can obviously tell, like I said, it's not part of this grid pattern. Um, so this is this is when they decided to do that. So this is long after the Dutch had anything to do with this. This has been established as New York at this point. Yeah. With perpendicular streets. Besides making Manhattan perennially prone to traffic jams, this scheme placed New York in the tradition of classical city planning. Okay. There were New World precedents for gridded streets, from colonial Philadelphia to the planned cities of Spanish Mexico. All of these, however, traced or claimed descent from the rectilinear streets of Roman camps and cities. Although the commissioners who laid out New York's grid made no explicit reference to antiquity, they set aside land for the Grand Parade, a large park for military drills in the manner of Rome's Campus Martius. Okay. If the commissioner's plan referenced Roman city planning implicitly, the Croton Aqueduct, completed in 1842, explicitly imitated the most famous products of Roman engineering. Running 40 miles from the Croton River in Westchester County to a reservoir in Midtown Manhattan. 40 miles? Is that what it... Holy crap. It was widely compared with the Roman aqueducts. The design of the high bridge over the Harlem River, with its spectacular Roman-style arcade, made the analogy clear. Oh, I see. So it is like an aqueduct, because like right up here you can see the water source so then i guess this is is the uh is the aqueduct sort of thing or whatever that's called going all the way down carrying the water for some reason even though they have water down here 
Maybe it's because like maybe this is just fresh water and this is like all salty from the sea. I'm not sure. The most obviously Roman components of New York's modern cityscape are neoclassical public buildings and monuments. Most of these date to a concentrated period in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Okay, yeah, you can see the pillars right there. I was looking, I'm like, why does that look wrong? Like, what makes that Roman, you know? And then I noticed all these pillars on the side of it, which clearly has a Roman feel. At the apogee of the City Beautiful movement. Though rooted in a tradition of civic improvement measures, the movement was catalyzed by the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago, a shimmering white city created for that World's Fair by a consortium of prominent architects, inspired reformers across America to imagine that impressive public places could alleviate a wide range of social problems. The only yeah. architectural style suitable for such grand ambitions was neoclassicism. Classical architecture was assumed to ennoble the community through a visual language, both timeless and timely. When, for example, Congress decided to apply city beautiful principles to the National Mall in Washington, D.C., a delegation of architects was sent, among other places, to Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli in search of suitable precedents. That's Although cool. it inspired reimaginations of entire cities, like the famous Burnham Plan of Chicago. The principles of the City Beautiful movement were usually realized through individual buildings with neoclassical detailing and a Roman sense of grandeur. In New York City, the most distinguished such buildings were produced by the firm of McKim, Mead, and White. Among the most recognizable McKim, Mead, and White commissions were a series of cultural institutions, including the wings of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and two academic libraries, one for Columbia University, the other for a campus of NYU. Yeah, that definitely, you know, there's a lot of Roman architecture here in the United States when it comes to, to stuff like that. Um, you know, Washington, D.C. has a ton of it, too. Pennsylvania, I think, what, Philadelphia, maybe? Used to be, I think it was Philadelphia, used to be the capital of... Uh, of the United States before it was moved to Washington, D.C., I believe. Don't quote me on that. But I'm pretty sure I'm, whoops, I'm pretty sure I'm correct on that. Let me know down in the comments, though, right? Modeled on Rome's Pantheon. The firm was also responsible for the Manhattan Municipal Building, a 40-story neoclassical leviathan entered through a Roman triumphal arch and crowned okay. by a choir of pediments and thuloi. Adjacent Foley Square, bounded by two other imposing neoclassical buildings of similar vintage, suggests how much of New York might have looked if the city beautiful movement had lasted longer. As it stands, Foley Square is New York's closest equivalent of a forum. So, this, so the city beautiful movement, I don't know. I know there's a YouTube channel called City Beautiful, so maybe his channel's named after that movement or something. Maybe it has something to do with the movement. Maybe it's just completely coincidence and it has nothing to do with it at all. I, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the city beautiful movement, but evidently it has something to do with making cities look Roman, right? Like employing the, the, the architecture, the, uh, the, the design styles and the influence from, you know, uh, ancient Rome and bringing it into the modern city is what it sounds like. Which, you know, hey, it looks cool, so why not, right? I like the pillars. They, look, they do look grand. They do look majestic. You know, there's just something about some pillars that gives something, you know, a little bit more class, you know. The Manhattan Bridge, a short distance from Foley Square, shares its neoclassical styling. The colonnade that bounds the approach plaza on the Manhattan side was inspired by St. Peter's Square, and the gateway through which traffic passes was modeled on the Arch of Titus in Rome. Impressive, though, the Manhattan Municipal Building and Manhattan Bridge. So they're trying to make it, so they're replicating, like, an old city gate, pretty much. You know, like, back in the day, you would have, like, walls and stuff around a city to protect the city, right? You'd have a big gate there, you know, in case you needed to close the city off for attacks and stuff, you know, like while, you know, when you're being attacked. So they, to me, it looks like they're trying to replicate the, 
the feeling of that. Which is whatever, yeah, it looks cool. But it's not authentic, right? <laughs> Rome. Impressive, though, the Manhattan Municipal Building and Manhattan Bridge are. Neither could compare with Penn Station, arguably the most spectacular neoclassical structure ever built in America. The main waiting room, two city blocks long, 150 feet tall, Jeez. and clad in Italian travertine, was modeled on the baths of Caracalla. Two city blocks long? That's a big... That's a big waiting room. I mean, and look how tall that ceiling is. That is just insane to me that is a that's a that's a tall ceiling the architect was so concerned with fidelity to his model that he visited the baths with a team of workmen whom he posed among the ruins to gain a sense of scale okay it was in monuments however that the city beautiful movement found its purest expressions the most famous example in new york is the washington square arch another mckim mead and white design modeled on the arch of titus its decoration combines classical and American motifs to celebrate the centenary of George Washington's inauguration. Yeah, but you can't drive under that one, though. So that one's not as cool. That one's just there for, like, you know, picture taking and, like, you know, just going and checking out. Only budget constraints prevented the installation of a full blown classical quadriga on the attic. The Washington Square Arch and Penn Station mark the apogee of Roman influence on the cityscape of New York. Finished, respectively, in 1895 and 1910, they were products of an era in which New York was poised to overtake London as the largest and richest city on Earth, and America was assuming unprecedented prominence on the world stage. I think London's bigger. London is double. It says, as of 2022, London's population was about 9.5 million versus New York's 8.1 million. Size-wise, New York is 783.8 square kilometers and london is 1572 london is bigger than new york by nearly double okay but it's double the size it's got a little bit more people but not double the people so it's not as densely packed but then again you know well, I know, I mean, never mind. I mean, London does have some pretty tall buildings, but not as many, you you know, as, as New York, I don't think. Neoclassical architecture, universally recognized and respected, expressed the confidence of the burgeoning metropolis and nation, but it also acknowledged cultural allegiance to the old world. Only with the skyscraper boom of the 1920s would New York City come to be associated with a distinctively American architectural style and begin to grow apart from the legacy of imperial rome for yeah you know i could see that too because there is a lot of that architecture now like we overused it here you know it's all over washington uh you know philadelphia has some boston i think boston has some of that kind of architecture okay so i think that's it a more right? in-depth discussion of how classical architecture shaped new york Check out my podcast interview with Professor Elizabeth McCauley, which is linked on screen and in the video description. There you guys go. If you want to check this out more in depth, make sure you go check out their podcast episode 21. And like I said, the links to the original video is in the description section down below. So if that's something you want to go check out, you can find the link to this video through the link down below. And then you will find their link to the podcast you're after, right? Well, anyways, I'm going to end this video right here. And you guys have a super fun, awesome day. And I'll catch you in the next one. Take care, bye.